Okay, hey there folks, welcome back. Since book tour and conventions have been put on hold for a while, I figured I would bring book tour to you. So welcome to season two of Russ's Rock and Roller Coaster, intriguing interviews with creative minds. Uh, Sci-fi and fantasy is a complex genre and one populated with wonderful female authors and characters, but that path has come with its own challenges, opportunities, and trailblazers. So tonight, we will be talking about the evolution of a genre, the women of sci-fi and fantasy. On our panel is Nebula Award-winning author Esther Friesner, who has written 41 novels, more than 200 short stories, edited nine anthologies, and is, published, is a published poet and professionally produced playwright. Say that three times fast. She created the popular Chicks and Chainmail series for Bain Books and the Princess of Myth series of YA novels for Random House. Hello, Esther. Hello. Good to see you. Also, nice on, you. also on our panel is Laura Ann Gilman, author of more than 20 novels, including the award-nominated uh, uh, Vine Art War Trilogy and the award-winning Devil's West series from Saga Press, Simon & Schuster. Her forthcoming projects include a Gilded Age historical fantasy and the start of a new contemporary fantasy series. Hello, Laura. Good evening, everybody. All right. And last but not least, my friend and social warrior, Alana C. Meyer, has worked as a journalist in Jerusalem and a cultural critic for various publications and written book reviews and critical essays for The Globe and Mail, Los Angeles Review of Books, Salon, and The Huffington Post. She's also the author of the fantasy series, Last Song Before Night, Fire Dance, and The Poet King. Hello, Alana. Hello. Hello, all right. So for the folks at home, before we jump in, uh, feel free to send in questions or comments for Esther, Laura, and Alana in the chat box, and we'll get to some at the end of the show. All right, so we're all writers here, but gender issues seem to be as prominent as they've ever been. Um, so when you first got started um, in your writing careers, and I'm gonna start, we'll start with Esther. Um, was gender an issue for you? Did you look to other female authors as role models to follow, or was it just a matter of writing's my jam, I love sci-fi and fantasy, and I'm going for it? Well, as far as I was concerned, uh, I did not encounter them, but you know, back in the day, as they say, it used to be that women can't really write science fiction. And I was writing fantasy, so I didn't have any problems with it. Uh, a friend of mine who uh, was published at the time, they made her use the initials. You know how women used to have to, women writers in the field used to have to have initials at, because, or have male pseudonyms. And I did not run into this. I don't know if it was because I was particularly blessed or also a very, very good chance that I was particularly oblivious. This, uh, this can happen. I had small children in the house and between, well, taking care of them and doing my writing, I wasn't paying that much attention. So I'm sorry, I'm not a very good historical resource. Not at all. What about you, Laura? I have, um, I came into things kind of sideways because I was an editor before I was a writer. Well, I was a writer, but I was an editor before I was a published writer. And I was fortunate enough to have two very strong women um, mentors in the field. So, by the time I was getting ready to send novels out, I had already learned basically full steam ahead and don't let anyone give you shit. I, um, I knew that, the, that there were roadblocks out there. I also had learned from the professionals how to get around them. I, I, they really, uh, Susan Allison and Ginger P. Cannon gave me immense help in being confident and, and saying, no, I'm not going to use initials. No, I'm not going to take a pseudonym. Yes, I am going to write what I want to write. And I know that I will find a home for that. I'm not sure if I would have ever gotten out of the gate 
without that. Having those mentorships was, was incredibly important. So, and I think mm -hmm. probably a lot of women who came in when I did have similar stories of a female writer or female editor who said, don't let them give you any crap. Alana, what about, what about you? You sort of came, you have a very different path from, from the rest of us. What, what about you? Um, different in what way do you think? I'm just curious. Um, well, I mean, you, you were, you know, born in Israel, you know, you, you were, uh, oh, right. See. You didn't start out in fiction necessarily. So your I path did, was, though. right. Um, I mean, this is uh, something I get asked a lot. People ask, you know, how did you get from journalism to fiction? But the, um, the truth is that uh, I've always written fiction. Um, I wrote a fantasy novel in my teens. Um, wow. Because in Israel, I didn't understand what was happening in class. So I wrote a book instead. Um, so I, you know, actually, I have always been actually quite ferociously determined to become an author and whatever I did in the meantime, whether it was administrative work or later um, journalism was just to pay the bills. Um, and I got to do some really interesting work along the way, but the entire time I was working on my book. So my first book took seven years to write because I was trying to fit it in in between what I was doing to pay the bills. Um, in terms of being a woman author, um, I have to admit, uh, I didn't really think very much about that when I was doing the work. Um, it was only later uh, when I was in the publishing, uh, what do you call it, the publishing ecosystem, <laughs> that I started to think about it. And that might have already been too late to be thinking about it, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it would have been smart to have initials. I don't really know. I mean, probably given that my work doesn't have like a lot of fight scenes and is, you know, very character oriented, I probably wouldn't have been fooling anyone anyway. But yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so it's not something I thought about very much when I was getting into it. Right. So and so the three of you kind of came into the, let's say, the fiction side of things at different times and had your own paths. Were you ever um, confronted with issues where you felt, you know, roadblocks were thrown? I mean, there are roadblocks for all of us, um, but were there roadblocks that were specific to you that either were just specific to your situation or even being, you know, um, a, a woman writer in sci-fi and fantasy where you were told that you couldn't, you shouldn't, some or others were trying to sort of knock you off the path, or was that just sort of, there was nothing gender specific to it? Um, so, Alana, why don't we just stick with you? Well, for me, that question is intertwined in the religious background that I come from, uh, because there was a very specific path I was supposed to take. I was supposed to get married when I was, you know, 21 and 22 at the most, and have a lot of kids and all this stuff. Um, and so, already, the path that I took... Um, was diverging away from that. Uh, and the, um, the gender side of it uh, played into that in the sense that, you know, women don't do things like that um, in Orthodox Judaism. Um, I couldn't even bring myself to write a sex scene for the longest time, it was just terrifying. But <laughs> <laughs> so I, I suppose to answer your question more directly, there were psychological and internal roadblocks um, more than anything else in the beginning. Well, that, that's interesting, actually. S stick with that for a minute. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are, um, you know, there may be situations or other people or institutions that try to get in our way, but we can all be our own worst enemies, our own, we could self-sabotage. So go into that, um, you know, a, a, a little bit more. I mean, what were the um, I mean, I understand some of the cultural side of it, but what was in your mind anyway? What was, do you think, was maybe holding you when you were held back? What was, what was, what part of you was holding you back? I think in the end, there were a lot of external forces mm -hmm. that were kind of collaborating with the internal ones. So that's a difficult question to answer. There was so much discouragement. Mm. Um, from 
you know, my immediate environment. Uh, and so I don't know if I can really speak to there being self-sabotage per se. Mm. Okay. Laura, what about you? Professionally, um, as a woman, I did not, yes and no. This is one of those uh, go not to the elves questions. I came up originally through short fiction in the horror field. Hmm. And uh, then, and probably now, being a female writer in the horror field is problematic. Yeah. Let's just put it that way. I did not get taken seriously, especially since I wasn't, um, I was already established in another publishing element. I wasn't anybody's pet, which tends to happen a lot uh, for young female writers. So it was, it was hard as a short fiction writer to get any traction and to feel like I was being taken seriously. When it came to the novels, I was incredibly fortunate in that my first um, 10 novels actually went to Luna, which was a fantasy imprint that was created uh, as part of Harlequin to showcase female led, female written fantasy, um, not necessarily romantic fantasy, but fantasy with a strong female lead, a little bit of romance, very little bit in the case of my books. So we immediately had this sisterhood. Uh, a lot of us, the writers who started there or, or who were published there were still actually pretty tight. And that was incredibly helpful. I think any anytime you're the start of some new group and we were the first couple of years of Luna, you get a boost from that. Mm -hmm. And we got a lot of uh, support. So I managed to avoid what I know a lot of other writers went through in established lists. What I did have was this sort of sense in the back of my head of everybody's going to think that I, um, I got this contract because of who I know, because I was an editor. Mm -hmm. And I did actually get some pushback from that. A lot of people who presumed that, and I had felt like I had to prove myself over and over again. By the fourth book, I had pretty much put that to bed though. <laughs> well, hold on, stick, stick, stick with that point though, because it was, it, was, it was interesting. Someone, I don't even remember who it was. I think I saw it yesterday or even today, in fact. Someone made a post on Facebook, something about kind of um, knocking uh, Joe Hill a little bit because, um, and I didn't even realize this, in the movie Creep Show, at the very beginning, the way the movie opens, the little kid who's reading the comic book, that's Joe Hill. That's Stephen King's son which I didn't happen to realize is, oh, well, there you go. I mean, how many of us get to be in a Stephen King movie and then have Stephen King as your dad to push him along and nepotism and yada, yada. But the world is filled with, with, you know, the world is filled with who you know, and it seems unfair unless it's somebody you know and it opens up a door for you. But if you were getting pushback, like what, what was that resentment? I want to understand that nuance a little bit more. Um, there was a feeling, and again, this is, I can only speak to what people said to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know what wasn't said. There was a feeling that the only reason I got a contract is because I was friends with the editor or because I knew somebody who, you know, that, that I had that, that side door into it. Um, was that amongst the, uh, your fellow writers or amongst the readers as well? Uh, no, it was mostly other writers. Mm. Uh, most readers didn't notice or care, um, right. especially back then. Nobody knew who the hell the book editors were. Uh, and there was especially among people who hadn't gotten a contract, they're like, oh, well, you must have taken my spot kind of thing. And I'm, I'm, it's not like it happened a lot. It happened enough just to make myself sort of go, mm, no, okay, no, I earned this. And I know I earned it because I had like five books rejected before they bought the new one that right. they bought. It's right. not like this was straight out of the gate. Uh, it did, it does make you sort of hesitate though. And this is where I suspect a lot of guys wouldn't even have thought twice about it. Mm -hmm. um, they wouldn't have said, okay, you know, what is somebody thinking about me? This is, this is a female trained trait. I don't, I don't know. I don't know that that's necessarily true. The degrees might be different. Uh, the, the degrees might not be quite the same, but you know, there's. But nepotism is, is definitely a problem. Right. And I say problem. Right. For a lot of us, uh, we have a number of people in the field whose parents were writers. 
I mean, let's face it, it, it tends to kind of gallop in families. Yeah, it's the family business. Yes. Uh, and a lot of them will hide that, at least until they feel that they're established well enough. And so I can't blame them. Go back for a second. You said something that was interesting. So you said that, um, you know, female writers have a tough spot in horror. I'm not a horror guy, so I don't, I don't pretend to know the world, but I've been introduced to it more over the last couple of years. And I've, at least on the readership side, I have found the readers to be incredibly open and welcoming. Is that not the case on the publishing side? I mean, and I'm not an expert, so I've I'm not. Of, I've been out of the horror field for a while, and I've made I have some great friends in the horror field, but there's a lot of misogyny there. Mm. There was a lot of dismissal of female writers. Mm. Um, a lot of the 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 stuff that we're trying to stamp out in science fiction fantasy in terms of creepers and presumptions really had deep roots in the horror field. Mm. And a lot of people are trying to, to work with that, but it was also a thing. And it drove a lot of us out. Huh. So let me ask, I wanna stay kind of on this thread. It was one of my next questions is sort of, you know, an element of getting published is making the right contacts and having a community. I mean, let's face it. If you don't know an editor, it's just harder to get over the goal line. If the editor knows you and they like you, they're more likely to take a look at what you do, but that's not in all cases. What's been your experience out in, um, it's a two part question. One, and we'll start with Esther, um, on being in the sci-fi and fantasy kind of broader community. And then also specific to sort of, I mean, it's not working right now, but normally during kind of like the convention circuit and kind of networking that way. What's, what's it been like for you? Oh, networking in the convention setting. Uh, I started out on such a wrong foot. I had no idea what science, that they even existed. Uh, after I published my first couple of stories, a friend of mine said, come with me to Boscone. It is a science fiction convention. You should see who is reading your stuff. So we get to the hotel, which was at that time when mammoths wandered the streets of Boston. It was the Park Plaza Hotel. And we walked in and I looked up on the balcony and there was a Wookiee. And I said, I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> and I swear I was planning to go home. And I did go home the next day, but not before. I spoke to, well, my friend who had brought me there was a, a vendor. She was in the dealer's room. And I had to say goodbye, but I hadn't gotten my membership yet. So I spoke to one of the, and I will name names because I am grateful to Priscilla Olson, who is one of the shining lights of Nesva and Boscone. And Priscilla said, to me, I said, oh my God, I want to go see my friend, but she's in that room. I don't have a badge. And she said, oh, it's okay. Go in. And then she said, would you like to go see the art show? And I said, okay. And as I was sitting in the cab, because I had already, well, you know, just doubled down on I'm leaving. Um, I sat there thinking, well, you're a fool. These are nice people. This is a lovely place to be. And so I came back to science fiction conventions. Other wrong thing I did involves a Carmen Miranda costume. I had seen the Wookiee, right? Uh, it's kind of like seeing the elephant. And I went to my, one of my next conventions in a hall costume. Bad move. I'm supposed to be a professional. Professionals don't wear costumes, especially not Carmen Miranda costumes. Oh, dear Lord, no. Anyway, over the years, uh, I have, you know, I've met editors. I met editors who rejected my stuff. Uh, and I discovered things that helped me to continue in my career. Because, you know, when you get a rejection, you do go through this feeling that, they're rejecting you as a person. Mm -hmm. You are an unworthy person. They're rejecting 
the book. They're rejecting the story. And one of the uh, editors who had rejected it recognized my name and said, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, I wanted to buy it. Uh, the book in question was New York by Night, K-N-I-G-H-T, which, um, you know, is, is published, just not by that editor. He said, we had just bought another fantasy set in New York City. And it was basically, you can't follow a banjo act with another banjo act. Uh, when they say sometimes on the rejection slip, does not suit our current needs, it really doesn't suit their current needs. So putting a face to the editors and for the editors to put a face to me was very, very important. Uh, there have been some conventions where I have come home, oh God, there was one where I came home with eight, either I'm buying something, I'd like to see something, eight different business opportunities. Great thing, eight business opportunities. Bad thing, I told my mother, every time I went to a convention after that, well, where's the next eight? Mm -hmm. so, so, so Laura Ann, so I know you, you're certainly no, um, uh, no newbie when it comes to the convention circuit. We've even, we've sat on some panels together even before. So what's, what's it, what's it for you? I want to, and I want to be a little bit more surgical here. So when you're out, you know, at conventions, signings, readings, that kind of thing, are you specifically looking to network and connect with female, other women, writers, editors, publishers, or is it just, I just want to connect with good people and it's sort of gender isn't relevant, or is it both? Gender is not relevant to meeting new people. Uh, I grew up in fandom. I went to my first convention when I was 11. So I was scarred early and often. <laughs> uh, matter of fact, the first person I met at a convention was Isaac Asimov. Oh, get out, really? Oh, yeah. oh, you meant that That's literally. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> No, when I go to conventions, oh, I'm... Oh, 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 go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. Don't, 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 don't skip over the, go back. So tell me, so you were, you met Isaac Asimov when you were 11. It was, it was Lunacon 1978, because I'm old. And my parents let me off at the door. I was meeting my aunt and uncle and my cousins there. And my parents were giving me all this last minute instruction about, you know, listen to your aunt and uncle, don't get in trouble. Da, da, da. And there were two couples walking out, obviously going to lunch. And the, one of the gentlemen overhears my parents saying this and says, don't worry, we'll take care of her. And they laugh and walk on. And that was Isaac. <laughs> Thankfully, my parents did not know that. Otherwise, they might have you know, packed me in the car and taken me home. <laughs> uh, but no, when I go to conventions, I'm there to meet my clan. I'm there to see my people. I don't think of conventions as networking experiences for me. I think of them as um, family reunions. Okay, I like if I, that. Do, if I do network while I'm there, it's a plus and it's never to be sneered at. And obviously you will make appointments and you will say to editors, let's have a drink. You will say to writers, right. let's sit down and talk about stuff. But I'm there to um, refill the well. I'm there to enjoy myself. I'm a fan yeah. at heart. Right. Um, these are my people. Yep. And for however long I'm there, I just kind of wallow in it. And it's probably been to my detriment professionally that I'm not more of an active networker. But when I was an editor, I was doing that constantly. Right. I was always meeting with writers, meeting with, with agents, meeting with, with foreign editors. It's exhausting. It was. It was. By the time I, I was an editor for 16 years, and by the time I was done, I was done. So now I just try to enjoy myself and um, it's more about contacting with readers when I'm at conventions. So I, I, I wanted to ask um, all of you, um, so over the last, let's say 20, 30 years, so, and I'm just gonna pick out two names in particular. So Anne Rice and JK Rowling in their times in particular were two fantasy authors that became household names. Were either or both of them, was that an inspiration for you, you know, as because they were, you know, famous female authors? Did it not matter to you at all? I mean, was it relevant, not relevant? 
Uh, so let's start with Alana. Well, rolling is already too far along, even for me. I, you know, <laughs> by the time by the time Harry Potter came out, I was a very long-standing fan of fantasy, and if anything. I was a little annoyed that all the people who had told me that the books I loved were nerdy for so many years were suddenly reading fantasy. It was like, oh, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> How about Laura, what about you? Um, yeah, pretty much. Rowling hit, actually I was reading one of her books on a vacation when I got the word that I'd sold my first novel. Oh, that's cool. Um, which was kind of fun. Uh, my family was sharing the books because we it was too heavy to bring more than one copy. No, they, they didn't really influence me other than to say, oh, wow, look, um, hey, look, you know, proof that, that there is a readership out there and to admire their storytelling skills. Mm. If you're going to name a, a woman writer who hit big and influenced me, it's Anne McCaffrey. The White Dragon hit the New York Times bestseller list, I think it was, when I was a kid. And that was a major, major influence. Um, so I think, yeah, we have to go back a little bit earlier. Okay, great. So, so follow on that thread. So, so Esther, were there any, you know, female authors that kind of hit it big that you said, oh, wow, that's, that was an inspiration for you or? Well, um, Rowling, way after my time, and Anne Rice, um, it just, it didn't, uh, let me say this, it wasn't the gender that mattered, it was the book. Mm. Uh, not Anne Rice's books, but certain books just open doors. And I wasn't really paying attention to the gender of the author. Uh, one book that really made me say, that's what I want to do when I grow up, was The Last Unicorn. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw that in college, and Peter S. Beagle, again, not, not female. It's just the way it happened for me. Maybe it, because, uh, it was because there weren't that many female writers who were that prominent at the time, mm. uh, or just that I did not see them. Along in my career, I was invited to, uh, to participate in an anthology about Witch World, I think it was. I hadn't read any of the books. Uh, I read a lot, but I don't read encyclopedically in the genre. I read a lot of different things. Uh, I guess I read history uh, avidly. And I do read in the genre. I started out with Isaac Asimov, Caves of Steel, and Peter S. Beagle and Tolkien, of course. But if I read a female author's work and it captures me, then that's it. Not because she's female, but just because she's got the magic. All right, so I wanna switch gears just a little bit. And I, I was thinking about this the other day. So as I was talking about earlier, so I have 10 year old twins, I have a boy and a girl. And they went through this phase where, you know, it was all, you know, superheroes was the thing. You know, they were watching the cartoons and this, that. So, of course, I had to do the dad thing. And I bought them 80 gazillion action figures, the little ones, the big ones, everything I can get my hands on. And they were both totally into it. And I remember one day and I was looking at because I had them all laid out on the floor. And in, in a row, it was Hulk, Thor, Superman, um, Iron Man. And on and on, and I'm looking at these, and I realized, and I kind of had that aha moment. I'm looking at my because my son is all into it. And I looked at my daughter, and she loved and she loved Iron Man, and she loved Thor, and she loved Hulk. And I'm thinking, well, there are no, there are hardly any female superhero action figures. I mean, maybe you could get Wonder Woman. Even Black Widow was hard to find, and Storm. And I, and I realized, wow, what is that like to not have? 
a lot of female superheroes being out there as the model. So I'm wondering for you guys, either as readers or as writers or fans, were there female characters within sci-fi and fantasy that, that you emulated or when you're writing, do you think of it that way? You know, writing from a gender specific point of view, how significant is that for you in your own, in your own careers? And I'll start with uh, Alana on this one. Well, I have a very vivid memory of going to the used bookstore in Jerusalem and going through the, um, the used fantasy novels that were on the top floor in the loft. And I was with a friend and we would make fun of the covers. Um, specifically, we would make fun of the covers that showed women in various like ridiculous, you know, positions, you know, like simpering or wearing bikini chain mail. Like we were just like, couldn't get enough of mocking that. And at the time it just seemed funny. And then I got older and as often, or maybe always happens, I got mad. And, and you know, my, my attitude shifted a little. And when I write, it is certainly something I think about all the time um, when I write female characters. Think, thinking about what, so you're saying, you know, that they were visually depicted in, let's say less, less, less than gratifying ways you get upset about it, how does it translate onto the page for you? How does it, how does it come from the feeling to the words? They were depicted either as objects or as not fully realized human beings. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, they were either objects to be attained or they were some kind of fetishized, badass, whatever, um, but never, as people, and that was something, and, and that element of uh, the depiction of women in fantasy is something that I set about to interrogate, certainly in the first book, um, because the first book in particular I wrote without the um, <clears throat> quote unquote benefit of Twitter um, in the background. Um, and so <laughs> I was really just alone with my own thoughts and with, and the things that were very personal to me. Uh, and uh, it, never, it never left my mind, a uh, certain anger that I had about what I had grown up being told a woman was. And not just a simpering weakling, but she could also be, you know, this badass with no personality, like it could go either way. What about you, Laura, Laura Ann? When I was, out of college um, and starting to take my writing more seriously, that was about the time that the strong female character became uh, all the vogue, uh, both in genre and also in, in, in science fiction and fantasy, also in mysteries. That was uh, when the, the, the female detective really exploded into publishing. Mm -hmm. And there was this real push to have these strong female characters who are basically just male characters with boobs. <laughs> right. That annoyed me. It annoyed me as a reader, as well as a writer, and it certainly annoyed me as an editor. So I consciously, when I started writing, specifically Ren Valere, who is uh, the lead in the first, uh, the Costume Nostromus, the Retriever series, I wanted to write a character who, yeah, was strong and was also deeply flawed and was occasionally a coward and was occasionally weak and did screw up. It was really important to me to make this character true rather than the, the quote unquote strong female character a la Black Widow that we, we got to see. Because yes, that's fun. Everybody, I mean, Xena, I love Xena. But it's not always the best character to carry with you throughout an entire book. So that affected me in that sense of we either had it, yeah, as, as Alana said, a non-existent or an object female character or someone who had to be superwoman. Mm. And I wanted to be able to find that middle ground where you had right. a fully rounded, grounded character. So that's always in the back of my head because I did grow up with those, those two extremes mm. uh, competing for cover space. How about you, Esther? Oh, thank you. I 
this it takes me back to the 80s where everything was indeed between the rescue object woman and the super tough as nails and also by the way all men are horrible uh, and I did not like this and I too tend to get angry and my anger always turns into I'll show them I'll show them all so I decided to write a book in which the main character was female and she wasn't a great warrior and she wasn't a rescue object and the name of that book gentle reader was harlot's ruse mm. yeah uh not not exactly well not exactly a warrior and yet a warrior and not a rescue object she could pretty well take care of herself and I enjoyed writing this book so much that I do believe I finished it in the shortest amount of time for any book I ever wrote. Mm -hmm. So anger and I'll show them all are just wonderful inspirational uh, features to have. You light the fire and, and, and so and then we have some fireworks. Sounds good. But uh, another good. thing Alana said was about the cover art. I was at a convention in the art show and people were doing what you were doing, Alana. They were dissecting some of the paintings that were of, well, chicks in chain mail. <laughs> and that was when <laughs> inspiration happened. <laughs> I remember that. Uh, and making, I remember that. Yeah. I think it was a boss cone. And uh, I just sat there going, oh, my God. Chicks, I don't know. I, I have a very weird muse, but she decided to show up and um, tell me, this is a good title. And we found a publisher pretty quickly. And then the actual publisher himself said, the women are going to kill me if we have this for a title. He was eventually talked into allowing it, provided that there was a disclaimer on the back of the book saying, this wasn't my idea. Oh, fuck. His oh, idea. Uh, right. Jeez. Oh, it was, no, it was a great selling gimmick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. And I got a fan letter. Well, I didn't get a fan letter from Lucy Lawless, but I do have an autographed picture, thanks to the series. Ah, very cool. cool. Uh, quick yeah. interlude for the folks who came in a little late. If you have any questions or comments for the panel, send them in the chat box and we'll get to a few at the end of the show. So we can have one more question before we move on to the, uh, to the fun and games. All right. So the theme of this panel is the evolution of a genre. So from your vantage point, and we'll stick with Esther, um, has the genre evolved, sci-fi and fantasy in regards to women, has it evolved? If so, what have been the best changes and where would you still like to see the genre go? Well, I don't know where I'd like to see it go. Uh, I really don't. And that's because I like surprises. And for good or for ill, the world seems to be throwing us a lot of surprises. Uh, but I think that we are seeing a farewell forever to women can't write science fiction. Women have to only write fantasy. Uh, and we are seeing a farewell to the use of uh, disguising a woman writer by having her just use initials. Now, we do still have some wonderful women who are writing using their initials, but in this case, it's a choice, not something foisted on us. Um, I, I'd really like to leave this to people with, uh, as I said, I'm not an encyclopedic reader, so I would like to hear what the other panelists have right. to say. All right, Alana, what about you? How do I see the genre having uh, changed? Has it, ha has it evolved? If it has, if, in what ways, and wh where else would you like to see it go? Hmm. 
I can only talk about what I've observed because I don't, like Esther said, put it earlier, I don't read encyclopedically within the genre. Uh, I think that sometimes there is an issue of people imagining that the thing that they have just done is the first time it has ever happened. Uh, I, I think that there has been quite a lot of, there have been quite a lot of books by women over the decades that, you know, really haven't been that much improved upon in terms of just giving us an accurate idea of women's experiences and just somehow they are not remembered when it's time to list the names in the canon. So I'm not really sure how much has changed so much as that we have this strange amnesia when it comes to female authors. Hmm. Laura Ann, what about you? Uh, I'll try to keep this brief, but I could go on for about 20 minutes on this topic. <laughs> um, I think it definitely has changed because as we've discussed originally, it was definitely a boys game. And then women started writing, but that was when fantasy became a uh, downgraded because women were writing the same as you can document in a lot of fields where women become uh, dominant the pay goes down the prestige goes down that happened with fantasy and then it started to come back but yeah we were still seeing men being lionized for a lot of things that um, women were already doing and that was frustrating i think that's still happening but people are calling it out now. And I think that's what's really has changed is that there isn't the sense of don't rock the boat, don't talk about it. For the last number of years, people have been saying, no, we're going to talk about this and we're going to talk about it publicly and we're going to name names. And I think that's been incredibly healthy for the field that we have to look at our crap and say, okay, yeah, we do this. We need to stop doing this. Uh, there are a lot of writers now, female writers who are writing fantasy, are writing science fiction, are writing both, are crossing over and not being penalized for it, mm. which is incredibly important. Um, and of course, because my brain goes completely out of my head, I am blanking on the name I wanted to reference, uh, Murderbot. Martha Wells. Martha Wells, thank you, Martha's gonna kill me. Uh, but Martha was a fantasy writer, great fantasy writer, switched over to science fiction, great response. She's still a great fantasy writer. This is something that we can do now and not have to hide or change our name. Mm. That I think has been a really, really good change, but it's still a fight. So wh where I would like to see it go is the point where this is normalized. This is expected that anyone can write anything and there's not an expectation of, well, somebody does this better because of gender or somebody sells better because of gender, because we saw that a lot in Salesforce saying, well, if there was a male name on this, we could sell more. And that wasn't actually always true. It was just the perception of that. Right. And I want to, I, I want us to see, see us get rid of that entirely. Okay. Did I keep that short enough? No, that was great. <laughs> All right. So now it's time for a special section. We'll have, we have, we'll have more time at the end. I promise. Um, now it's time for a special segment where we spin the wheel. So here we go. On the wheel are seven, <laughs> are seven categories. Wherever it lands is what you get. The categories are Spend That Money, Music to My Ears, Quantum Leap, Space Meal, Fear of Flying, Stranger in a Strange Land, and Beam Me Up, Scotty. Laura Ann, you are up first. You ready? All right. All right. So, what do we got? All right, Space Meal. All right, so let me go down to my, I always have to remind myself what I do here. All right, so you're about to be whisked into the universe on a trip from which there is no return. You get to have one meal of your choosing prepared by anyone you want, and you get to choose your dinner companion. What is that meal, and who are you with? Anyone real or character-driven, or character? Yeah. Real, real uh, or that, fictional? That's not even a contest. I would want to sit down and have dinner with um, Lord Peter Whimsey and Harriet Vane because the meal would be fabulous, the conversation would be exquisite, the wine would be beyond belief, and I'd get to meet Bunter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. All right, Alana, you, you, you ready to play? Sure. All right, here we go. All 
All right, what do you, you got Quantum Leap. So, all right, you've volunteered to step into the Quantum Leap Accel Accelerator, only you get to pick where you go and when within your own lifetime. Where are you headed? I get to pick where I go. And when within your own lifetime, where are you headed? Like, where do I want to travel to? Any, any, any time and place within your own lifetime. Oh, within my own lifetime. Oh my God. Yes. Okay. Now you just killed me. What do I do? Um, <laughs> Wow. Um, there was a period when I was living in Jerusalem in my mid twenties and I had just met the man who would become my husband and I had just started throwing off certain restrictions that had never really done me any good. And that was a really awesome time. And I'd go back to that. <laughs> Okay. Hmm. Okay. A little ambiguous, but we'll have to follow up that later. All right, Esther, you ready? I am ready. All right, here we go. All right. Well, no, you got quantum leap, so no, no duplicates. So we're going to go again. Bye, bye, bye. No duplicates. All right. All right. Beam me up, Scotty. Okay. So what do we got? We are. Well, look, we're all in dire need of a quality vacation now more than ever. Scotty is manning the transporter and can send you anywhere in the cosmos, real or fictional. What's your vacation spot? Oh, I know I should pick something fictional, but you know what? No, I'm tired. I will go to Hawaii. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I will one. go to the Big Island. <laughs> Yes, yes, the big island with uh, all the different climates and the coffee and the chocolate and the beaches and the volcano because, well, little volcano never hurt anybody. And uh, yes, thank you. The big island of Hawaii. Right. Make it so. Sounds I would have put money down on that answer, Esther. Oh. <laughs> it was that or Singapore. Uh, good choice either way. Okay, so now we're going to move on to our advice column. We're all writers here and for the writers out there, and we'll start with you, Laura Ann. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given or heard someone else give, and what's the worst? The worst is write to the market. Don't write to the market. Never write to the market. Uh, the best advice... It's one that I have passed on to many other writers, which is AIC, which stands for ass in chair. Mm. It's the only way anything gets done. Sit yourself down or stand yourself up if, if you're working at a standing desk and do the work and do it regularly. Uh, everything else is just figuring out what works for you, but you have to put ass in chair first. Can't argue with that one. All right, Alana. How about you? Best and worst advice? Well, the worst advice probably was the successful author who told me before my book came out that my entire career for my entire life would be decided in the first week that my book came out. Um, I mean, I hope it's not true. It just sounds a little ridiculous to me. Um, and it does not seem to be true for a lot of my colleagues, so I don't think so. Um, best advice probably came from this uh, column that I used to read, the uh, famous author Cheryl Strayed before she was famous when she was writing an anonymous advice column called Dear Sugar. Um, I got hooked on that column and she advised a writer who was stuck that she both expected too much of herself, that she was too arrogant, um, and that she was also being too hard on herself. And that the only way to move forward and to actually get the work done was to be in the middle, to not think too much of yourself and not think too little and just do the work and have respect for the work. And that 
um, I thought was really beautifully phrased and has gotten me through some stuck times of my own in my writing. All right, fair enough. And how about you, Esther? Well, uh, I never got anything I could call the worst advice unless you count seeing bad examples of don't mean me, uh, where people say, well, yes, I know it says we only publish stories about unicorns and I have a story about toxic sludge that goes to Vassar, but don't mean me, I'm gonna send it in anyway. Uh, it's toxic entitlement, which happens in the field sometimes. Uh, now the best advice was actually something I already pretty much knew because I have a horrible mercenary little heart, but this was, this was very, very, well, it said it all, money flows toward the writer. And what it means is watch out. There are a lot of people who want to be published in the worst way. And that means they usually will be. And along the way, they will run into people who will say, oh, we aren't gonna pay you anything, but think of the exposure. No, um, agents who say, well, anyone can say they're an agent. They say, yes, you have to pay me to represent you. Real agents, well, I'm sorry, not real, but reputable agents get a percentage of what they get for you when they sell your book. Um, money flows toward the writer. And I've noticed people don't value what they get too cheaply. So if you don't set a value, not necessarily a price, but a value on your work, you are going to regret it. Can't argue with that at all, very good advice. So we've got a few minutes, so we're gonna take some questions from the audience and I have one for you, Esther. Um, yep. was, was, Psalm, was Psalms of Herod, Swords of Mary also driven by anger? Did you get pushback for such a different style than your lighter novels? Oh my gosh, no, uh, actually. Well, actually, Psalms of Herod and the Sword of Mary were supposed to be uh, part of a series. And yes, it was very, very, very different than anything I'd done. It was absolutely brutal dystopia. Uh, I met N.K. Jameson at a, an event at Sarah Lawrence, and she said those books scared her. So I feel very honored by that. I never really got any pushback about those books being different from what I had written. I hate being put into a pigeonhole. I am well known for funny fantasy, but the nebulas are for very, very serious stories um, about female reproductive rights, etc. cetera. And um, well, the only pushback I got, now mind you, on those books, there was a warning saying, these contain very disturbing material. I actually got a letter from somebody who said, how could you do this? My daughter read this and, uh, and now she's all upset. And I'm thinking, read the warning, pay attention. It means something. And frankly, the cover design was also very grim, which was appropriate for those books. There would have been more, but unfortunately, the publisher is no more, uh, was no more. So we stopped it too. All right. Well, all right. This has been a great hour. Uh, so before we wrap up, it's time for a little shameless promotion. So Laura, Laura Ann, what, what do you got for us? I got no covers to show because I, I did not come to class prepared. Oh, but uh, I'm reissuing the Costa Nostradamus series, all um, 10 books, four novellas, and a story collection uh, with the author's edition, which has been fun because revisiting those books. And in October, forthcoming is uh, Leather Tomes and Spider Webs, which is a literary fantasy anthology, which has a story of mine that I'm really, really proud of that's really kind of dark, as is appropriate. 
-hmm. And as you mentioned early on, coming next year, I have a standalone Gilded Age historical fantasy coming out from Saga Press that is... Um, my beta reader called it delightful. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, S sign me up. All right, Esther, what about you? What do you got for us? Okay, uh, I just have two things to show, but before I do, I'd like to do a little shameless promotion for somebody else, namely some of the cartoons that are really putting women in front in science fiction and fantasy. Steven Universe, shout out to Rebecca Sugar, and the Owl House. They're wonderful. Uh, they're a little subversive. They're a lot subversive. And you should be, well, Steven Universe on reruns and the Owl House right now. So this is the cover of one of my YA princesses of myth, the first one in Nobody's Princess, Girlhood of Helen of Troy. It wasn't all about being abducted. And then I have got a short story in Galactic Stew, fun with food allergies and aliens. And I will have a story coming out in the next edition of Unidentified Funny Objects, which is a wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful series of humorous oh science fiction anthologies. All I can tell you is a cement manatee is key. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Alana, what do you got for us? So I just completed my first fantasy trilogy this year. It came out, the third book came out during the pandemic, yay. Um, the first of the series is called Last Song Before Night. Um, it's showing up backwards for yep. me. I hope it doesn't no, for good. you. Well. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's Last Song Before Night, Fire Dance and the Poet King. Um, and uh, the last book just came out this March. All right. Well, thanks, Esther, Laura Ann, and Alana for a great show. And I want to thank everyone who's watching. I'm your host, Russ Colchimiro. And since we've been talking about the evolution of a genre spe specific to female authors and characters, it just so happens if you're a fan of space opera with loads of female characters who teach the boys a thing or two, check out my own space opera cr cross line about a modern day space pilot thrust into a parallel earth caught between rebellion, Armageddon, and a desperate fight to get home. And if sci-fi mystery is more your game. Hot off the press, Crackle and Fire, featuring my hard-boiled intergalactic private eye, Angela Hardwick, who was hired to find a missing intern with stolen corporate files, but soon finds herself tackling with dueling gangsters, angry protesters, and a madman from Earth with galactic ambitions of his own. They're both available on Amazon and published by Crazy 8 Press. All right, thanks everyone uh, for a great show, and I'll see you guys next week. <laughs>